Hi, my name is Vic and welcome to this extended episode of the Armourer's Bench. In this episode we will focus on the Armourlite AR-10 7.62mm NATO calibre battle rifle. The AR-10 can rightly be described as the older, bigger brother of the AR-15 5.56mm rifle and all the derivatives of that rifle. The original AR-10 never really rose to prominence or achieved its full potential back in the 1950s when it was originally conceived, designed, manufactured and fielded, albeit in limited numbers. The problem with the AR-10 in those times were manifold, but if we look at the major reasons it never achieved the success it should have, it can be put down to several points. It was looked at as too radical and different in looks, design and method of construction. It was a little too late for most military rifle selection trials of that era. Teething problems related to new technologies employed in the design took some time to resolve. Politics, especially in US military tests and trials, were stacked against it, especially where there was a US ordnance competing design, i.e. the T-44. There was a not invented here attitude. Once serial manufacture was achieved, it was slow, and deliveries to actual customers were sometimes deliberately delayed by sales agents. For example, Sam Cummings of Interarms would route all deliveries via his Manchester UK warehouse. After several country-specific versions of the early Dutch manufactured artillery and Recton rifles were sold, the final definitive Portuguese Model 961 or NATO model finally rang out all of the problems and issues with the AR-10 and the design had matured into a battle-worthy rifle and then the Dutch Defence Minister Hans Visser shut down all rifle manufacture at the Artillery's and Recton factory, effectively killing the AR-10 stone dead. Politics raises its ugly head once again. That death knell for the AR-10 came in May 1961, coincidentally one month before I was born. Customers who had bought the AR-10 were effectively left high and dry, with no further factory support for their rifles. Only the Portuguese parachute battalions and the Italian Comsubim special forces scrambled to purchase what was left of rifles and spare parts out of the factory before production was halted. From that point on, rifles could not be repaired or replaced with any form of factory support and subsequently they wore out and were ultimately replaced in most countries' inventories by other small arms. Now, let's fast forward to the very early 1980s. I myself at that time was working part-time for a firearms dealer in the UK. During that time in the UK, if you were approved by the local police and had a firearms certificate, you could purchase or acquire semi-automatic rifles in most calibers and military surplus rifles were abundant. The predominant rifles available at that time were, for example, the FAL in all its guises and variants, the L1A1 being surplus by the British and Australian Army at the time in large quantities the M1 Garand and M1 Carbine. The Belgian SEF N49 and the HK G3 were all available in plentiful numbers. And surprisingly, the AR-10 was available at that time in quite large numbers. I myself must have had two to three hundred AR-10s pass through my hands. The most prevalent models were the Sudanese, Guatemalan and Portuguese pattern rifles. Good condition varied from unserviceable suitable only for parts reclamation to very good collector and shooting condition rifles. These good condition rifles were nearly always Portuguese M961 rifles. The Paras really worked their rifles hard but looked after them. After all, their lives relied on them. At that time the two major surplus small arms importers exporters in the United Kingdom were Interarms which was owned and run by the infamous Sam Cummings and Sedum International, which was owned and run by a gentleman called Jacques Michaud. I visited Interarms in Manchester a few times on buying trips, and they were housed in the former Daily Dispatch, Daily Sketch newspaper works, which had been converted into a warehouse. In the mid-1980s, the heyday of surplus small arms was on the wane, and there was not too much variety available, certainly no AR-10s at that time. I was a frequent visitor to Sedum UK, 
They were headquartered in the UK in the quiet Somerset town of Highbridge, where they occupied an old bonded warehouse. The variety of small arms they sourced was fantastic, and whilst the quantities of each individual type were not large, typically no more than a few dozen to a few hundred of each type, Sedum had the knack of buying up small arms they had supplied to clients many years earlier. After all, they knew where they were because they had supplied them. This is how they acquired many Portuguese AR-10s, as Jacques Michaud had sold them years before. They did, in fact, source Sudanese AR-10s, which had been captured from rebels in the African country of Chad by French army units during Operation Manta in 1983. So, the very last models of the AR-10 supplied by Sedum to the Portuguese for use by their parachute battalions, and also some of the very earliest model AR-10 supplied by Interarms to the Sudanese were sold by Sedum on the surplus market. I converted around 100 rifles to semi-automatic only fire for sale on the British, Australian, New Zealand and Canadian market, which was completely legal at that time in the 1980s. Around that time, I became aware of research by Blake Stevens and Edward Azell for a new collector-grade publications book, the M16, Black Rifle Retrospective. I knew that Sedum UK had two of the Armalite AR-15 prototypes, serial numbers 2 and 3, in their small museum in the UK facility, and I sought permission from Jacques Michaud to photograph them for the book. Monsieur Michaud graciously allowed me to take photographs of the rifles, and also divulged to me that he had been instrumental in the early years of the uh, Armalite company, actually funding the project before Armalite was formally created and Fairchild Aircraft Corporation was involved. Jacques Michaud's history and background in small arms and the huge impact he had on the development and production of the AR-10 and other projects will be the subject of another video on its own. Suffice to say, he was the polar opposite of his rival in business but good friend Sam Cummings of Interarms, who actively courted publicity. One coup that I managed to achieve at that time was that I was given permission to reproduce by a telecine process a rare AR-10 promotional movie that Sedum had from around 1958. This was a salesman's uh, promotional uh, movie that was used to showcase the AR-10 to potential clients. This showcased the actual Hollywood manufactured in California produced AR-10s and actually showed the designer of the AR-10, Eugene Stoner, showing off the capabilities of the rifle and its variants. The production manager of Armalite, Charles or Chuck Dorchester as he was known, can also be seen stress testing the rifle in the laboratory. Another individual, a designer or draftsman is shown in the movie. Alas, I have not been able to identify that individual, so if you know who it is, please let us know in the comments. I made five copies onto VHS videotape in the PAL format, and apparently one of the copies got into the public domain, as it can easily be found on the internet. Unfortunately, it is a poor reproduction, and I suspect it suffers from being converted from the PAL video standard to the US NTSC standard. I recently found my copy, and I digitally enhanced the old VHS tape, which we will now watch. It is still not without its faults, but you can now make out the serial number on the demonstration rifle, which is number 46, and also see the original selector markings which were changed after trial showed that the rifle could be knocked onto full auto fire whilst being dragged through brush. I have been promised the opportunity to digitally scan the original 16mm movie again with modern equipment and techniques. Hopefully in the next few months we'll be able to bring you that HD quality copy. Now, sit back and watch the promotional movie. Afterwards, I will show you an actual Hollywood-produced rifle. And in upcoming episodes, we will show you the Dutch-manufactured artilleries and rectum rifles and light machine guns.
Light AR-10, the modern combat rifle, a lightweight, rugged, and versatile weapon that combines the accuracy of a sniping rifle with the firepower of a machine gun. Designed and manufactured by the Armalite Division of the Fairchild Engine and Airplane Corporation, the AR-10 is being heralded as the most important achievement in small arms development in the past 80 years. Behind the introduction of the AR-10 lies the technological and manufacturing resources of the Fairchild Engine and Airplane Corporation. The same diversified facilities and specialized experience that have distinguished Fairchild in the aircraft industry have contributed to the development of the world's most advanced combat rifle. The engine division with its metallurgical experience in jet engine development, the guided missile division with its advanced plastics techniques, and the engineering leadership of the Fairchild Aircraft Division have been combined with the talents of leading gun designers to produce the Armalite AR-10. Fundamental to the reliable and versatile operation of the AR-10 is a new concept of design, the application of lightweight metal alloys and plastics to a simple yet extremely functional gas operating system. Using a patented bolt and bolt carrier assembly, the AR-10 has eliminated the offset structure and added weight of the long operating rod and piston found in conventional automatic weapons. In addition to their separate functions, the AR-10 bolt and bolt carrier together form a unique piston and cylinder. Gas taken from a port near the muzzle is carried back through a gas tube and fed directly into a chamber created by the bolt and bolt carrier. The essential parts are cylindrical so that all forces involved are directed in a straight line from the barrel to the stock. This is one of the principles of design that assures the outstanding performance of the AR-10. Other important features include a three-position selective fire lever. This lever is readily accessible to the shooter's thumb, providing for semi-automatic, full automatic, and safe positions. A rear sight that is click adjustable for elevation. The sight, as well as the visible yardage scale, is protected by the rugged carrying handle located at the center of balance of the rifle. A bolt release on the lower receiver, Within easy reach of the left thumb after inserting a loaded magazine, avoids lost motion during rapid fire. A special trigger guard that opens easily to provide ample room to operate the trigger while wearing winter mittens. The AR-10 weighs less than seven pounds. Compared to the familiar M1 rifle, it takes 50 rounds of NATO ammunition to balance the scale. This savings in weight means an extra 50 rounds that a rifleman can carry into combat. The AR-10 has also been designed for fast, economical production. The lightweight alloys can be machined at three times the speed of steel, and every part can be produced with conventional machines and tooling. Production experts are astonished at the short time and low capital required to establish the production of this quality weapon. The entire disassembly of the AR-10 can be accomplished in less than two minutes without the use of tools. This will serve to emphasize how low initial cost, the low cost of maintenance, and the low cost of training personnel are all due to the simplicity of design. First, the bolt assembly is easily slipped out of the receiver. Only a few high-quality steel parts make up the bolt and bolt carrier assembly. They are all protected by a hard, corrosion-resistant, low-friction plating. The extremely strong locking area on this front-locking rotary bolt has withstood hundreds of thousands of rounds without any failure. To strip the lower receiver, only a cartridge is needed. Both halves of the receiver are light alloy forgings, processed with a hard anodized finish that outwears steel two to one. All of the trigger group components, other than the pins, are fabricated from steel by the inexpensive lost wax process. This method of casting greatly reduces the number of machining operations and still provides high quality parts that are completely interchangeable. The plastic components are made from readily obtainable materials and require none of the careful selection and long aging of wood. For instance, the buttstock, which houses the driving spring and buffer assembly, is not subject to warping, rotting, or splitting. By merely depressing a retaining pin, the entire driving spring and buffer assembly are removed. In a conventional gas operating system, the next step would be to disassemble the operating rod and gas piston. However, in the AR-10, no moving parts are required to bring the high-pressure gas back to the bolt group, so there is no need for further disassembly of moving parts.
The muzzle brake flash hider assembly is easily removed to facilitate cleaning after extensive firing. This highly effective muzzle brake reduces the recoil by approximately 40%. Corrosion-resistant material, ease of assembly, and interchangeable parts reduce the service and maintenance of the AR-10 to an absolute minimum. The AR-10 features a quick-loading principle embodying the use of a very lightweight preloaded magazine which under combat conditions is thrown away. Because of the extreme light weight of the magazine, a rifleman can carry his ammunition preloaded without weight penalty. Firing of the AR-10 with a complete absence of lubricants or in a chemically clean condition has, in every country where this test has taken place, resulted in a performance far exceeding any requirements. The AR-10 rifle will fire longer without cleaning or oiling than any other known rifle. condition in which the AR-10 excels is the sub-zero temperature test, including exposure to icing and refreezing. Note that the winter trigger guard is folded out of the way to allow the use of a heavy glove. sand test is one that has stopped many of the world's best weapons, yet the AR-10 has gone through the most severe of these tests without malfunction. None of the adverse conditions tests, including sand, have left any permanent ill effects on the weapon. Performance in mud is probably the most difficult of all adverse conditions. The close-fitting dust cover helps make it possible for the AR-10 to outperform all other automatic weapons in this test. demonstration of rapid fire illustrated the use of preloaded magazines. The rifleman fired 100 rounds of NATO ammunition in 30 seconds. As soon as a magazine was emptied, the release button was pressed with the trigger finger and the empty magazine dropped. Firing was instantly resumed upon insertion of the next loaded magazine. Rapid fire is wasted fire unless the weapon is controllable. The straight line stock and well-balanced design of the AR-10 makes possible the ease of handling and accurate control. A factor influencing this remarkable controllability is the specially designed forearm. Constructed of fiberglass with a foam plastic insulating liner, this forearm protects the rifleman's hand from extreme barrel temperatures 
and provides a firm grasp in any shooting position. Even though the AR-10 needs cleaning and oiling less frequently than any other rifle, under field operating conditions, a simple field clean only will keep the weapon functioning indefinitely. The hard plating of the working parts prevents fouling elements from adhering. This enables the parts to be cleaned by wiping with a cloth. The simplicity of field cleaning also makes it possible easily and quickly to train a recruit in a minimum of time. The carrying handle serves as a rigid base for mounting a scope sight. Firearms experts are much impressed by the fact that this weapon, with the firepower of a machine gun, has all of the inherent accuracy of a fine sniping rifle. The straight line recoil forces shorten the recovery time necessary between shots. The AR-10 launches grenades in rapid succession. Twenty grenade launching cartridges can be fed from the standard magazine. Only on the AR-10 can this be accomplished without rifle alteration or adjustment of any kind. This also permits the instant changing from grenade launching to combat ammunition. In offhand firing against a man-sized target at combat range, the AR-10 is in a class by itself. Quick, on-the-target performance means a maximum effectiveness for ammunition expended and inspires complete confidence on the part of the combat rifleman. Whether this remarkable weapon is used as a basic infantry rifle, a submachine gun, a highly accurate sniper rifle, or a belt-fed machine gun, one action, one logistics problem, one training program, and one ammunition makes the AR-10 the only weapon in the world to fulfill all small arms requirements. The AR-10 represents an historic milestone in small arms progress, the result of highly specialized research and development by the Armalite Division of the Fairchild Engine and Airplane Corporation in conjunction with leading military figures of the world. The unprecedented acceptance of the AR-10 has brought about mass production of this automatic weapon in Europe. As a result of this production, AR-10 rifles are fast becoming available for tests and evaluation to all interested countries. The lightweight, Rugged, simple, reliable, accurate, and versatile AR-10 invites comparison with any other automatic weapon in the world. Welcome. My name is Vic, and welcome to this edition of the Armourer's Bench. Here we are at the Dutch Military Museum in Schusterburg, and where we're having a very privileged uh, view of some of the uh, rare exhibits that they have here at the museum. What I have here is a Hollywood built AR-10. So it's an AR-10B model. Um, this is the last iteration of the US manufactured AR-10s with the side mounted gas tube, the beer can suppressor come flash hider, and the original marked and uh, utilized safety selector where safe is in the up position. This rifle is one of only about 56 AR-10s that were manufactured in the US before production moved over to artilleries in Recton in Holland. There they improved the rifle with input from designers in the US and also from their own engineers who 
inputted a lot more design aspects than really has been attributed to them. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at the various models and iterations that Artilleries in Recton built here in Holland and go through as many different variants as we can. It's a very sad story of a development and an excellent rifle that was never really brought to its full potential. Only about nine and a half thousand rifles in total were built. The exact number is not known, but a lot of militaries tested it, found it to be an excellent gun, but through various different reasons didn't adopt it. Several people did. The Sudanese, the Guatemalans, the Portuguese Special Forces, the Paras, and the Comsub of the Italian Special Forces adopted the rifle and wanted more of them. But production was shut down and that was it. I came to know the AR-10 in the 1980s as an armourer to a surplus dealer where we had an awful lot of those Sudanese and Guatemalan rifles came back as surplus. Strange enough to the uh, dealer who was part of the sales team, Jacques Michaud of Cedum International, and I got to know that rifle very well back then. What we're going to do now is have an overview of how the rifle works by showing you a cutaway, and then we'll go through the various models in close-up, including this rare Hollywood version. So we'll be right back. 